sing a loss, aloha de tulum, how a ICL DC, Slavkalas Hinadikium, Hadaguaistu, Hadaguaistu di Escogum, di Hadogum, di Odogum, Had Kilkasu Society, Shangulum, SFU, School Gogum, Ayat u Had Kilgu Susum, Eat Tulum, Sanyway, Escant, Hadaguai, how a Sing a last good day, aloha my friends and family. Today I'm going to talk to you about ancestral connections. My name is Lucy Bell, Stuffed Ellis, and I'm a language, Haida language learner. I've been a Haida language paper pusher and coordinator, and I've done my master's degree in Indi indigenous language revitalization as well. I am now a PhD candidate, focusing my attention on Haida museology and I work in the museum field. And on the side, I, I still work in Haida language. The Haida language uh, is a language isolate in British Columbia, Canada. There's only a handful of speakers of my dialect left today. Um, but on the positive side, there's an amazing, great team of language learners still doing the hard work of becoming language learners and working towards their own fluency. There is a Haida philosophy I want to acknowledge today. Um, everything is connected. And I'm sure I could talk forever about all the things that are connected to language learning. Uh, I'm gonna focus on five of them today. The ancestral connections to ourself, to our language family, to our ancestors, to our environment, and to our separate supernaturals. I would like to acknowledge my Hodkill family. I hope some of you are out there watching me, and I hope that you'll forgive my rusty Hodkill. So I will start on those five connections. The first one is the importance of being connected to self. To new learners, I think this is really an important um, connection. It's probably one of the most important connections that you need. It's so important to acknowledge our uh, our our own soul. It's so important to keep our, our soul strong and rooted and healthy. Um, there are ways that we can do that uh, simply going to the beach, going to the forest, taking quiet time, um, doing the emotional hard work and learning Haida is, is stressful and, it, and there's a lot of um, mourning and sadness and happiness um, that goes along with that. And to acknowledge those feelings and work through them, that's so important. Um, one thing our ancestors used to do is fasting, chaslong, chesal, um, fasting to, to cleanse the body and to strengthen ourselves. There is also uh, the importance of, of prayer, and safang gusu is to pray in Haida. Um, another way to help connect. Our, our own soul and to keep ourselves um, protected is to carry our own traditional medicines. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. The next connection I want to acknowledge is our ancestral connections. So important for us to understand that we're not in this alone, that our ancestors are rooting for us and that we have to, to acknowledge them and call on them uh, for help. Our, our late relatives suffered so much colonization from missionaries, from collectors, from the potlatch law, uh, anti-potlatch law, residential schools, and speaking Haida was punishable. And to acknowledge that sadness that our ancestors must have carried um, and that they probably still do carry today. That's, that's important. Um, 
in 2016 when I was learning Haida for quite a few years and I felt like I was stuck and still still felt like such a beginner I I asked myself um, and then it turned into a thesis what would our ancestors do what would our Haida ancestors do had they known that our language was hanging hanging by it by a thread and I asked you know I, I did the archival research and listened to old recordings and read through old old writings and then asked quite a few Haida language learners and elders and cultural people what they think our ancestors would have done and it turned into a 200 page uh, thesis um, strengthening our Haida voice. And th these are some of the lessons that I'm talking about here today. So some of the things I think our, our ancestors would have done was to live and learn together. You know, Haida's lived in big longhouses and we were, well, my ancestors were so connected to, to family in one big house and they did everything uh, together. My ancestors would also eat the traditional foods and stay stay healthy and to work on keeping the body and, and the mind well. Um, not not eating you know fast food and Chinese takeout so much that we do today. I know our ancestors would have conducted ceremonies and rituals to revitalize the language as well. Our ancestors would have also taken their traditional medicines. And they would have listened to their to the land and to the environment and call on their ancestors and call on the supernatural beings that they would always call on for, for help in, in times of despair. So I think ancestral connections are incredibly important and you just cannot be a language learner without acknowledging those ancestral connections and calling on them, praying to them and making food offerings, any, any way that you know how to make that connection to your own ancestors and honoring the, the, the lease. Uh, the, the lease is the um, word we use for the invisible umbil umbilical cord that connects us to our ancestors. Being matrilineal, the, the lease connects me to my mother, to her mother, to whom, her mother, all the generations back. And you know that's an incredible um, connection that I think matrilineal people are so lucky to, to have. And I feel really, really lucky to have that and to work at strengthening my, my own lease. The third connection that I want to talk about is our connection to our language learning family, um, to acknowledge the people that we are learning with. Uh, I had the pleasure of learning, starting with, with my own daughter, Amelia, in the language nest. Um, she's going to be 20 th this year, but that really was a good place for me and my daughter to start our our language learning and to connect with the, um, our relatives around us. Um, I went on to organize a language um, boot camp with in intermediate learners. Um, and four, there were 14 of us and elders and teachers in our class. And that was, that was a really important um, part of my learning, you know, having those people to to rely on, to learn with, to make mistakes with, and you know, to have fun with. Um, I'm just so grateful for the Nanalong and Chinalong, um, to Nani, Mary, Jenny Claude, Lawrence, Donny Gertie, Nani Dorothy, Adelia, Jenny Stephen. Um, so lucky and um, just so grateful. Um, one thing that I was very lucky to have done was travel a lot with, with these elders, taking them to our international Haida language conferences and, you know, doing 
doing the things that you do when you go to the city, doing the shopping and, and eating out and going to the meetings and getting haircuts, you know, all those great things. And I was very pleased to have traveled with a group of language um, revitalizers and um, Nani, Mary and Trini Quad to Hawaii to study their language and all of the language revitalization activities and cultural revitalization that was happening in, in Hawaii. And that, you know, that really was a nice way to, to honor those two elders and to, to just celebrate what we've done and to see and learn from our Hawaiian relatives um, that it's possible. I would like to say hawa to my Hawaii cohort. Um, I love you and I miss you so much. The fourth connection that I would like to talk about is the connection to our traditional environment. Um, one of the my early graduate days, I, I learned the word topophilia and I learned it in, in an English class. And it topophilia is the strong sense of belonging and cultural connection to a place. And Haida's, like Hawaiians, uh, I think we have it so strongly because we come from islands and we know the boundaries of our territory. We know that this, that we belong to a place and I'm grateful for that every day. So I'll speak a little bit about the Haida connection to our ocean and to our forest. Those are incredibly important and those connections help us in our language and cultural revitalization. The connection to the ocean is, is so strong. We are saltwater people, we're surrounded. We live off the, the ocean, you know, the fish that sustains us and the water that cleanses us, um, and the water that takes us places. We have rituals um, for cleansing in the cold Pacific Ocean, and that, that builds our strength. And it's something that is coming back to life more and more. It's so beautiful to, to see younger generations doing that and the strength that they get from that. Another um, ritual from the ocean is tanga, the drinking of seawater to cleanse the inside. So in Haida, the cleansing of the insides is really important to prepare us for the new knowledge, for the luck, for whatever it is that we are asking for. And it really, it really does clean, clean out the insides. My ancestors have also taught us how to make offerings uh, to the supernatural beings in the ocean. Um, offerings of food and tobacco, fresh water, and flicker feathers um, can be made to, to the ocean spirits to help guide us in language revitalization. There's so many medicines and rituals, ceremonies that happen in our forest. The one that, that kept coming up in my readings and from my discussion with uh, elders was Jifunjiao, the use of devil's club for internal cleansing, to carry it for protection, for luck, for new knowledge. And it's still something that is practiced today and that we need to be mindful of as so much logging is, is destroying um, our forests nowadays. Another ritual that involves the forest and the sea is our puberty rituals. And they're, they're starting to come back more back to life. You know, they were, we were shamed out of that by missionaries and residential schools. And so much of that um, honoring of that important special time is slowly coming back. So for the Haida, uh, puberty, involves seclusion and involves ocean, stream, or lake cleansing. And it involves 
fault latching, celebrating that important time in a, in a young person's life. Uh, girls in puberty and women in mourning would be rubbed with cave uh, cedar bark by their sponolum, their paternal aunties, uh, for strength. And that cedar bark was folded and put into a cleft of a crabapple tree. Another ritual from the forest is the hemlock wreath. And this is something I'm glad to have done with my own daughter. So uh, a wreath would be created and decorated. Loved ones would, would hang treasures on, on it, like, like abalone, earrings or jewelry, money nowadays, I guess. And they would rub it, um, they would hang, hang it and the, 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 young, the young lady would cross, cross through the wreath four times and then it was hung up um, by her sleeping place and the um, needles that fell from that, she would keep that and that would be a symbol of her luck and good fortune in the future. Teed is another um, important medicine from the forest and spruce cones were used. There's mail coming at my door. Spruce cones and pitch were used a lot of times as a love medicine um, and they could be loved on your intended um, belongings um, and maybe these could be rubbed on our language resources um, to guide us and give us strength and love for the Haida language. Um, someone who is lovesick could also uh, get naked and sail to spruce cones um, down a river with, with their intentions um, for, for the person they're pining after. Um, I don't know, maybe you wanna go and give that, give that a shot. Um, you can tag me in that if you want. Um, one, one important uh, ceremony that was done to me that I didn't even know was done to me was the rubbing of spruce cones on my lips when I was a baby and a toddler, I guess I, I didn't really talk. And um, so my, my big brother Dooley told me about the ceremony that Tina Manani and Chinny took me out into the woods behind our, our house and did the ceremony of rubbing the, the um, paid, the spruce cones on my, on my lips and putting the words into me. And I do really believe that this, this is something that we should be practicing as Haida language learners today to put those words back into us. The next connection I will mention is our connection to the Sana, the supernatural beings. Our ancestors so relied on, on that connection to supernatural beings for help. And it, it comes through so often in, in our stories, in our songs, um, in, in the, um, art, the artwork, the belongings that our ancestors made. And in my, in my research, I came across about 24 of those that I thought could help with language revitalization. I'll only mention a few of them here. The way to connect with supernatural beings um, could be through prayer, med meditation, chewing tobacco, abstinence, uh, bathing in the cold water, cleansing the inside and outside of our bodies, making offerings for us that, that uh, could be the looking grease, liquor feathers, tobacco, high bush cranberries, wild crab apple. Um, I will mention just a couple of these supernatural beings that resonated with me. Uh, the first one I'll mention is Wad Adagong, master carpenter. He was the builder of things and he had a magical way about building things. And we, we need a lot of help building things, building our resources, building our, our team of, of language revitalizer, revitalizers. And I, I do believe that 
master carpenter can help with that. The other supernatural I'll mention is, is Skundal, little one. And he took everything lit so literally and it kind of got him into trouble sometimes when he took things too literally. And this is a reminder to me and to other learners to think about, to put, put aside our English assumptions and the taking things so literally in English. You know, there's so much more to learn in our, in our language. Um, if we can just put aside the, the English language. Jenny Claude used, used to give me heck um, and he'd be like, stop learning like a white woman. And you know, I, he didn't mean um, to, be, to be talking badly, um, but he meant for me to take off, take off my colonized way of, of thinking and be open to learning like a Haida and put, a, put away the assumptions. I will also mention the great fool, Slangud Alsana. He, he was a great fool and he made so many mistakes. Um, but when he spoke up, um, sometimes he would have a really good idea. So he, he was he gave some advice to the master carpenter and it turned out to be a good idea i think we need to think of him in our language revitalization um, because we're going to make mistakes and to be able to have um, some humility that comes with that for ourselves and for others that, that make mistakes, you know, to be kinder and to be gentler as, as we're learning. Um, and also to, to speak up, you know, it's, it's so intimidating to be a language learner and, you know, not quite get the sounds right. I, mean, I know what that's like. And to be able to make those mistakes and use our voices, you know, there's, that's the only way we're going to become speakers. One of my favorite supernatural beings that that I call on to help before I give talks or when I'm when I'm working, needing to needing to tell some something about the language or anything that I'm up to, is Story Woman. She's the keeper of our stories. She is the one who teaches us how to tell stories. Jadal Khaigana. Is, is her name in Haida, and to be able to call on her to tell our stories and to tell the story of Haida language and to, to just keep doing it and to be using the Haida language, I do think that she could help us with that. The last supernatural that I will speak of is um, killer whales. We come, you know, from from the Pacific Ocean and killer whales are all around us and they, they are so strong in our stories and it's so important to call on song when we're weary, um, when we need strength. And I did that in, as I was writing my, my thesis um, and made offerings to the sea, to, to them and they started to come to me in my dreams and it just really just gave me that, that perseverance to push on for whatever I was, I was working on and to, to know that, that they are with me. I think I will end it there. And um, if you want to look at more information on, on these connections that, that I spoke about, you can look at my 2016 thesis, um, Strengthening Our Haida Voice. You can find it on the internet. I'd love to hear more about your ancestral connections and keep this conversation going.